Good morning, everyone. Russ Barkley here with another weekly research update for research ending the week of July the 28th. Uh, yes, I am wearing a sweatshirt hoodie, and I do have the insignia of the US Air Force over here, having proudly served in the Air Force back during the Vietnam War. So uh, also, I want to thank one of our subscribers for nicknaming me Lobster Man, because I was speaking with my hands a lot during some of my uh, earlier presentation. So thanks for the nickname. I, I may keep that moniker. We'll, we'll see. So uh, this week, uh, there were four papers that I want to emphasize in this brief review. Uh, the others, as always, are listed in the thumbnail sketch that goes along with this particular video. So have a look at those. Uh, and as always, if I talk about an article here, I give you the link to the articles abstract and journal uh, in that thumbnail sketch as well. So, so let's get started. Uh, one of the papers that appeared just this week uh, is a meta-analysis. That's a review of all of the research on what is called diffusion tensor neuroimaging studies. So they did both a systematic review where they went through all the studies and looked at all the conclusions, and then they combined the results of all of the studies into a single meta-analysis. And so here we're going to be looking at the uh, brain development and brain imaging of individuals with ADHD. And specifically, uh, this kind of neuroimaging doesn't so much look at the gray matter outside surface of the brain, but at the white matter, the interconnecting fibers of the brain that link up all that gray matter to other structures in the brain and to other areas of gray matter as well. So uh, this is the sort of connective tissue, the functional networks of the brain. Uh, that's what the white matter comprises. So I, I just want to very quickly go through what they found here. Uh, they point out that this systematic review highlighted white matter alterations in the projections, the uh, commissure, which we're going to ta talk about in a moment, uh, and various association pathways in the brain associated with ADHD, and that disturbances in these networks and pathways were found to be linked to the severity of ADHD symptoms and to the severity of cognitive deficits as well. Uh, and then they went on and did the meta-analysis uh, and found uh, specifically that there were problems in the corpus callosum, and that is the band of fibers that links the two hemispheres together. So uh, let me show that to you here just so we can get oriented. Um, first of all, uh, this is the gray matter outside surface of the brain. This is a longitudinal study that was published a number of years ago by Philip Shaw and colleagues. Uh, and they did serial neuroimaging of ADHD children over a period of 10 years. And what this study found is that the frontal area specifically was much more delayed in its maturation. This is the outside surface of the brain now. Uh, was much more delayed than was found in the control children followed over time. There were some delays in the back parts of the brain, but the principal delays were in the frontal lobe areas, uh, both left and right. So uh, that's not new. We've known about gray matter delayed development in ADHD for quite a while. But what the meta-analysis is showing is that this blackened out area here, which is the band of fibers connecting the left and right hemisphere, also seems to be problematic in individuals with ADHD, suggesting that there is some degree of impairment in the way these fibers that allow the hemispheres to communicate are linking up. And specifically, uh, this appeared to get worse with age. In other words, it was more obvious in adults than it was in children. Uh, what was obvious are the impairments in these connecting fibers. Uh, if you want to have another look at it, here is how typical brain networks develop over time, going from the immature or less developed brain, where there's a lot of local interconnectivity of this white matter and networks, 
And then what we see is as people mature and become adults, there's a lot more of these blue long fiber connections. So various parts of the brain are reaching out and connecting to other regions that are further away than just those locally right next door to them. Uh, and that is what you should be seeing in typical brain development. Uh, and what we see in ADHD uh, are delays and disruptions in the development of these longer range interconnecting fibers, both inside each hemisphere, but as this meta-analysis shows, also between the two hemispheres in the fibers that are connecting left versus right. So uh, a very important uh, meta-analysis published this week on uh, brain development in uh, people with ADHD. So uh, let's move on to our next study. Uh, completely different. This is a study that comes out of Saudi Arabia. Uh, and it's a study of 425 parents of both healthy kids and parents of children with neurodevelopmental disorders, including ADHD, autism spectrum, and intellectual disability. And it's a study of the levels of anxiety, depression, and stress, or what the authors are calling burnout, uh, in these parents. And what they found is that, of course, as you would expect, parents of children with various neurodevelopmental disorders reported higher levels of anxiety and greater levels of burnout and stress than did the parents of typical children. Uh, again, we've seen that before. We have research going back in the 1980s showing high levels of stress in parents raising children with neurodevelopmental disorders generally and ADHD specifically. But what this study found, which is a replication of some of that earlier research I just mentioned, is that the greatest levels of anxiety and depression were found in the parents raising ADHD children, even in comparison to the parents raising children on the spectrum or children with intellectual disability. And by the way, that was also found earlier, where parents raising ADHD children reported even more levels of parenting stress than did parents with autism spectrum or other neurodevelopmental disorders. So this study out of Saudi Arabia uh, replicates what we had seen in earlier research, affirms that it simply isn't a US phenomenon, uh, because most of the studies done back about 30, 40 years ago were in fact done here in the US. So uh, I just wanted to give a shout out to this paper because of its international representation and also its replication of earlier findings on levels of stress, anxiety, and depression in the parents of children with ADHD as they go about raising those children. Next up is a study that was published in Development and Psychopathology that is yet another study on the relationship of childhood maltreatment and ADHD symptoms. Now, as you know, I have several videos already posted on the role of childhood adversity, trauma, maltreatment, and ADHD in ADHD symptoms. Uh, and in those presentations, I talked about the fact that the evidence so far shows a kind of reciprocal relationship between the two. Greater levels of ADHD seem to lead to greater levels of later maltreatment or childhood adversity. Uh, and earlier levels of childhood maltreatment are predictive to some extent of more severe ADHD symptoms down the road. But it's not like you can say, as Dr. Matei says, that all ADHD is due to early trauma. What we see is an interaction, each predisposing to the other. Now, what is unique about this study is that it shows that even before maltreatment begins, they looked at negative infant temperament, specifically negative emotionality, and then its role in predicting later maltreatment and later ADHD. This is a longitudinal study of a very large sample of children, 2,860 who have been followed for over a decade from their infancy to age nine to 10. This is the Fragile Families Project, as you can see here. 
And what this study found, again, fitting in with what I've said in our earlier, in my earlier lectures, is that in this case, negative infant temperament was positively predictive of both childhood maltreatment at ages five and nine and ADHD symptoms at age five. Now, predicting ADHD symptoms from negative emotionality it, it's not so much of a stretch because we know that one of the earliest signs of emerging ADHD in a child is going to be problems with negative temperament in infancy. We can't measure ADHD in infancy. And so we don't know if it's there or not. But what we do know is that negative temperament, in this case, negative emotionality, went on to predict ADHD by age five. Uh, and I would argue that that negative emotionality is simply a marker for ADHD in these babies that is going to develop later on. So the emotionality isn't causing later ADHD. It's an earlier sign of a high probability that that infant could go on to become ADHD. But what this is showing is that that early infant emotionality is also predicting higher levels of maltreatment in childhood. That's no surprise. Kids who are more emotional are more distressing to their parents. And parents who are already distressed or who may have their own psychological difficulties may be more likely then to maltreat their children. And so you get this interaction going between child characteristics, parent characteristics, and the likelihood not only of maltreatment, but of ADHD continuing. And as I've argued in one of my earlier presentations, oppositional disorder now becomes another possibility in children who are undergoing these kinds of family interaction patterns. So uh, again, just another study that is showing the reciprocal interactive nature of maltreatment and ADHD with each other and the fact that early infant signs of ADHD may be predicting later maltreatment. In this case, early signs of negative emotionality. So just one more study for us to consider, consider rather, in this um, very complex interaction between ADHD and maltreatment. Now, what this study did not do and it's a criticism that I've mentioned to you already in my earlier videos on maltreatment, is that they did not assess for the parents' ADHD symptoms and other comorbidities. Uh, and until you have studies that do that, and some studies have started to do that, it's very difficult to tell how much of this prediction of later ADHD and maltreatment is genetic. In other words, you've got ADHD in a parent, which is predicting ADHD in children, but it's also predicting some disruption of parenting. And all of that is going to create kind of a maelstrom within the family in which maltreatment may take place. So uh, that's just, I think, showing the complexity of these relationships. So it is not this simplistic hypothesis that Matei and others have about trauma leads to ADHD. Uh, it's a lot more complicated than that. And if we're going to help these families, as the authors of this study talk about, uh, then we're going to have to take a very nuanced, complicated look at what is going on uh, in order to look at who's at risk for maltreatment and ADHD later in childhood and adolescence. Finally, I want to wrap it up. Uh, with this study that was just published. Uh, and this is a study uh, out of uh, friends of mine, Michelle Martel, Patrick Goh, colleagues I've authored papers with at the University of Kentucky. Uh, this was published in Research on Child and Adolescent Psychopathology, and it's on aging and pubertal staging over an eight-year longitudinal study from childhood to adolescence, looking at how ADHD and any links with depression, anxiety, and impairment changed during pubertal development. Uh, and what did they find? This is also a very nice large study, 849 children with ADHD followed over eight years. And what they, follow, or what they found was that, first of all, males had higher levels of hyperactivity, impulsivity, and inattention than females. No surprise, we've seen that in other studies of children uh, and in teens. 
But what this study found, again replicating what was found in an earlier study on girls, is that females had higher levels of impairment than males. So in other words, females with ADHD can have somewhat fewer symptoms and still be as or more impaired than males with ADHD. Uh, why that is the case, we're not sure. It may have to do with role expectations about boys and girls. We expect boys to be more aggressive, hyperactive, rough and tumble, inattentive, uh, and therefore we may cut them a little more slack if they are, whereas females, we expect them to be as many people say, uh, much more controlled, self-regulated, uh, and uh, if you will, obedient to rules. And so uh, all I'm saying here then is that females with fewer symptoms can be more impaired. And that's what this study is demonstrating. Lastly, it found that depressive symptoms largely increased with age uh, and were highest among those with the greatest pubertal development. So the development of depression seems to be going along with the development of not only ADHD, but also uh, with puberty. Uh, no surprise, there may be some interaction of the uh, neuroendocrine sexual hormones with risk for depression. Uh, and certainly uh, what we're seeing here is that although ADHD symptoms, particularly hyperactivity, impulsivity, seem to be declining with age, we knew that already, inattention does not decline so quickly, but impairment is increasing with age. Why is that? Because older individuals, teens for instance, have more opportunities to interact in more situations and in more domains of life than younger children do. And as people mature and enter into these other domains that are now becoming available for them to participate in, we start to see impairment in new domains that were not previously impaired because the individual simply wasn't participating in them. So uh, you can see an increase in impairment despite a decrease in symptoms. Now, one other thing that might be mediating this that wasn't measured in this study is executive functioning. We don't see age-related declines in the executive deficit symptoms in ADHD as we see in their more traditional ADHD symptoms, these DSM-type symptoms. Uh, and so it's possible that with age, it's these underlying executive deficits with emotion regulation, time management, self-organization, uh, inhibition, that are creating these greater levels of impairment in this more diverse range of domains than we would see in young children. So just some food for thought there for you uh, out of this particular research study. Uh, so that's it for this week. Thanks for joining me. I hope to see you again next week. And again, if you like the material, uh, please subscribe to the channel and recommend us to others. I really appreciate that. So thanks, everybody. Have a good week. See you next week. Be well.